Hello, everyone, and welcome to week two for track one, Interactive Fiction. And with us, as always, is Kay. There, she waved now. There's a little bit of time delay. Uh, we also have Sherry, as well, who will be leading our discussion. Uh, I am Chris, and uh, welcome. We'll go ahead and turn over to Sherry now, and uh, we'll kick it off. Thank you, Chris. Okay, hi again, everyone. This is um, track one. And this is week two on narratology and interactive fiction. So I had a tough time trying to figure out what the title screen is going to be, simply because the history of narratology is so complicated that I don't know how to do justice to it. So what I did was I put four luminary figures in narratology that if you're familiar with narratology, you would recognize. So we have Roland Bart on the left, Vladimir Propp. Um, Right-hand side is Gerard Jeunet, and then uh, the philosopher Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. So those are the four, and naturally I will try to address their theory throughout this presentation. In the very center of the slide is one of the games I've been watching obsessively lately. It's called uh, Dreamfall, uh, Dreamfall Chapters, Book One, Reborn. And this is a uh, series based off of the original game called The Longest Journey. It's one of those adventure games. The longest journey at the beginning, though, it's a pure adventure game. It has point-and-click elements, but for the second game, Dreamfall, they really try to incorporate more of that uh, choose-your-own-adventure, CYOA feel to it, which is that depending on the, the, the choices you make, you might discover new narrative routes. Okay, So this is why those <laughs> images are juxtaposed this week, so just give you a setup. So if we can go next. All right. So I challenged myself this week. I thought that I could cover all these texts, and we'll see. <laughs> so uh, some of the texts we'll cover. First, we're going to cover that narratology piece by Lucy Guillemet and Cynthia Labesque. Uh, this is in 2006. And their particular piece on explaining what narratology is is focused on Gerard Jeunet. Okay? On the theory side, I picked the particular text by Henry MacDonald called The Narrative Act. Wittgenstein and Narratology, and that's going to be a philosophy-based article. The third text there is actually one of the primary texts, and I know I have assigned several full-length books this week, but I thought that since I'm going to explain to you secondary material in the primary text, that would be uh, right if I give you access to those primary ones. So this one is actually the introduction to the structural analysis and narrative by Roland Barthes and Lionel Doucette. And that's on 1975. So that one's also a big piece. So if we can go next. Okay. Um, three more things, but those are going to be brief. Um, I will also examine, help us examine, some of those narrative patterns and story structures. So those are actually graphics. Uh, one from Story Structure from John Paris. The other one is the Choose Your Own Adventure, uh, Adventure Book as directed grab by Shawn Michael Reagan. So Shawn Michael Reagan actually... Uh, challenged himself by actually doing a complete graph of one of the CIOA books that he liked. Um, and the last piece, and I hope we can get to this big one, is Narrativity of Computer Games by Breta Nietzsche. Okay, so let's go next. Okay, here are some guiding questions, so there's a lot of them this week, but I kind of narrowed it down to first, what is narratology? What is the difference between story, narrative, and narration? According to Gerard Jeunet, what are narrative mood, levels, instance, and time? What is focalization? How does focalization affect our access to a literary text? Concerning Ludwig Wittgenstein's concept of language games, how would the narrative discourse affect the meaning of the story? Why is the narrator always constituted by the narrative discourse? So I would explain later the difference between a story and a discourse. Okay. And the last question is, how can narratology be applied to interactive fiction design? And are ifs stories, narratives, or narrations? Okay, so that gives you lots of promises. So I'm going to go next. All right. So I thought, before I actually address the text, I want to give you some framing to the text we're about to cover. Okay, so the, one of the big questions you might have in your head is, why, why are we studying narratology uh, to understand ifs, okay? So again, interactive fiction, 
is a narrative work that offers readers the ability to interact with its internal story structure via text commands or interface interactions. To emphasize the spatial quality of game stories such as those in IfWorks, Henry Jenkins renames game story structure as narrative architecture. So, by the way, that particular text by Henry Jenkins is available in week one of our reading list, if you're curious to, to uh, review that. Okay? Narratology is a field that studies narrative elements and story structures and has an extensive history that references back all the way to Plato and Aristotle. For narratologists, a story, a narrative, and a narration are not the same things. The question of what composes a narrative is even more complex. And many game scholars believe that recognizing game elements which compose story structures, so they are elements inside structures, okay, can inform the design of new forms of narrative architecture in games. So go next, please. Okay. So then the question would be, natural question would be, what are the underlying narrative structures? I want to point out that it is very important to remember that we have countless narrative forms that you can actually, some would argue that you can create infinite narrative forms, okay? Um, and it's always based on those combinations and configuration, those are certain narrative elements and patterns. So the idea is that if we can find out what the narrative patterns and elements are, that we can compose them by putting them together in different configurations to create narrative forms. Okay? And in an effort to discover the underlying structure of a narrative, some narratologists such as Claude Levi-Strauss, Roland Bart, Joseph Campbell, um, Joseph Campbell, the hero, <laughs> the hero's journey, I think we are familiar with that since uh, last uh, track. <laughs> Yeah, okay. yes, we did that while we read a book on World of Warcraft, so so it was interesting to, to look at both of those. And that was an excellent review of that book. So I put Joseph Campbell alongside Levi Strauss and Lorman Bart because what they did was they all studied the narrative structure of myths, okay? And, and myths are essentially the oldest forms of narratives. So what they decided to do is to study myths so to understand the, the underlying structure for all narratives, okay? Now, other narratologists such as Lovie Wittgenstein, Gerard Jeanette, Vladimir Propp, and Roman uh, Jacobson, and Roman Jacobson we will not be able to cover today, but I wanted to mention him. Um, they all examine the strange nature of literary language. So on the one hand, you have uh, structuralists and formalists, okay, Russian formalists studying the structure of narratives. And on the other hand, you also have uh, narratologists that are looking at the strangest of language itself, okay. And therefore, if we can recognize the strangers of language, we can also see how literary language can be used to influence the reader's interpretation based on the design of its levels, patterns, perspective, timing, plot, etc. So I'm going to go next. Okay. Now we're getting into deeper stuff. So what are narrative topologies? Okay. So a topology is when you have, it's, it's an ontological uh, document, if you will. It tells you what exists in a universe of, of uh, this discourse, right? So narratologists have created topologies to address the universe of possible narrative elements and patterns that exist in various narrative forms. And this is, just to say this, this is not to say that all narrative elements and patterns exist in all narrative forms. So as I cover some of those elements and patterns, I am not saying, nor are any of the narratologists saying that, yes, every single one of these uh, elements exists in every single narrative. They are only saying that some of these narratives, you know, exist in several kinds of myths that you will see across the world, okay? We will examine narrative topologies created by some of the most influential narratologists, and it is through the study of these narrative elements and patterns that we can better understand how narrative forms are created. Now, also toward the latter half of this presentation, and this is a hope <laughs> that I have, that we will be able to discover or cover some of those possible ways that we can apply our newfound knowledge about narratology to the understanding of stories and digital games in if works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go next. All right. So the first text is Narratology by Lucy Guillermet and Cynthia Lavasque. And as I was saying earlier, they decided to discuss what narratology is by focusing exclusively on Gerard Jeanette. And Gerard Jeanette is a structuralist, okay? So those are the little cue to remind us we're looking at structures. So next. 
Okay, now I'm going to talk about the Tetrad, the story, narrative, and narration. So uh, Guillemet and Lavasque introduced us to the field of narratology by focusing the discussion on narrative elements and patterns via Gerard Jeannette's narratological poetics. Jeannette, as well as other structuralists, distinguishes the difference between story, narration, and narrative. So I gave you guys a brief definition of each of these to help you, okay? So story refers to the series of events and actions that are told by someone. In the told by someone part, you're referring to the narrator. Narrator is the person telling the story. So story specifically, again, if you look at the bold yellow part, series of events and actions, okay? And essentially, story is the what, okay, that is being told, the content of, of what is being told. Um, narration is actually referring to the telling process of the story. It's also known as discourse or how a story is being told. The how and the what are very different, okay? Last piece is narrative. Narrative is actually the final form of the story. So when you say story and narrative, those are also not the same. Story, once again, is a series of events and actions. And narrative is the final form, the narrative form that's, take, that's taken on based on how the story was told. So when you say the tetrad, those three work all together, okay? But we have to understand the difference first before we get confused when someone said this is a story versus that's a narrative. Okay, so next. Okay, now this is based on Jeanette's uh, poetics, okay? So, uh, and also his narr uh, narrative topology. So in his topology, he first start with four analytical categories for examining a story. And each of those categories contains several kinds of narrative elements. So he starts us off with narrative mood, narrative instance, narrative level, and narrative time. And each of those categories can influence readers' interpretation in different ways. Okay, So it's a little bit different than uh, when we kind of covered uh, reader response theory, which is how the reader interpret the story to make it new, right, to make their own story. But what this is a different direction now, which is the structuralists are trying to figure out, are there elemental structures in a, uh, in a narrative that can influence the way we understand the story somehow? Okay, So there are kind of tools, if you will. The combination of these elements beyond mere linguistic wordplay. So linguistics, you're talking about you know, grammar and how words are placed, grammatical structures. We're not talking about that yet, okay? So I'll explain the difference between linguistics, okay, and the study of the poetics of narrative. <laughs> um, they can also influence the readers depending on how you put those combinations together, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and show you a diagram that Guillemette and Lavas created. Thank you. So here is their summary of Jeanette's narrative topology. And this is actually in the text that's assigned this week, so feel free to open up that web page if this is hard to see, okay? But on the left-hand side, you have the four analytical categories. So you have the narrative mood, instance, levels, time. Now next to, the, next to each of them, so if you look at narrative mood on the right-hand side of it, you have two elements, which is distance, functions of the narrator, and it goes down. A narrative instance refer to the voice, time of narrative, and narrative perspective. You have narrative levels, embedded narrative, metalipses, and then narrative time, which is order, speed, and frequency. So without reading all those components <laughs> that falls under each of those elements, under each of the categories, you can see that narrative is not something so simple. Um, it is actually quite complex. That's why if you get confusion as to what is a story and what's a narrative, there's a very good reason for that. Hundreds of years, narratologists have been studying what exactly goes into a narrative. This is one screenshot from Gerard Jeanette. Okay? So <laughs> Chris read all of them. So let's go next. <laughs> so. Now, I'm going to talk about what Jeanette means by narrative mood. And I did forget to mention, I can't cover everything that's on that chart, but the text will cover that, okay? So you definitely want to read the text if you're interested. So this is what Jeanette says. Or actually, this is what Lavasque and uh, Guillemet says first. When a text is written, technical choices must be made in view of producing a particular result in the story's verbal representation. In this way, the narrative employs distancing and other effects to create a particular narrative mood that governs, quote, the regulation of narrative information provided to the reader. This from Jeanette, that little quotation. And according to Jeanette, all narrative is necessarily diegesis, telling, 
in that it can contain no more than an illusion of memesis, showing by making the story real and alive. Thus, every narrative implies a narrator. So, goodness, we already have two uh, vocabularies, but you will see these pop up a lot. In fact, if you study, if you type in game studies, you will see a lot of authors trying to figure out those differences. Diegesis really is the telling process, the way the story is being told, okay, diegesis. Mimesis is actually means to uh, representation. The original meaning, hearkening back all the way to Plato, actually means illusion or mimicry, okay? But the modern interpretation of mimesis means show or representation of something. And it usually means a representation of reality, okay? So some representation of. So let's go next. Okay. So let's show you what he means by that mood and distance. So there's one element under narrative mood. So under the element, you can see this component called distance. Okay. So they explain distance helps us determine the degree of precision in the narrative and the accuracy of the information conveyed. And there are four types of discourse. Okay. Discourse, once again, I know I'm bringing lots of vocabulary. Discourse is how a story is constructed, okay? The, the how part, the organization of the story. So one, narrati uh, narratized speech. The character's words and actions are integrated into the narration and are treated like any other event. So the example is he confided in his friend telling him about his mother's death. So there is this, we're still close to that person, the character that we're describing, the narrator, okay? Because he's able to tell us that the character is actually talking to somebody else, okay? So ask if he's seeing this happen. Next one is transposed speech in direct style. The character's words or actions are reported by the narrator who present them with his interpretation. So this is a little more distance, okay? So example is he confided to his friend that his mother had passed away. Notice the difference between example one and example two. Example two, the telling part is gone. So the telling is seeing someone verbalize, right? Seeing someone doing the action. But when the action is gone, it's more objective. It's almost as if you're reporting what's happening there, okay? So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, here are two more examples how further distance, okay? The third one is transposed speech, free and direct style. The character's words or actions are reported by the narrator, but without using a subordinating conjunction. So this is farther. Example, he confided to his friend, Colin, his mother had passed away. Now, I know Kay have seen this, and I'm sure Chris have seen this. Um, academic papers, you know, the title is always something, something, colon, something else, right? This kind of uh, structure is actually supposed to be this equals that, because colon means an equal sign in English grammar. <laughs> but <laughs> but not, not, in a, not in conference papers. <laughs> oh, well, yes, yes. Um, but the colon, <laughs> have you noticed that's more objective, right? So it feels kind of distant. And yeah. when you write academic papers, um, you're supposed to make your paper sound objective. So have mm -hmm. you employed the colon technique, Kay? Yes. <laughs> oh, you mean, you mean the, the colon technique for, okay, my sentence can only be this long or I don't know how, how to word this, so I'm, put, I'm putting a colon in it? Yes. Yes, very good. <laughs> I just thought this is, that's an example where it feels more distant, right? So you have that colon construction. The last one is called reported speech, which is the farthest one. The character's words are cited verbatim by the narrator. So that means you're quoting now. It says, he confided to his friend, colon, my mother passed away. So you see the four levels there. The last level, when you're quoting something, that means you're just reporting like a reporter. You're reporting what's happening, but you're farthest away from the action itself. Now, Jeanette will tell you, if you examine those distances, the distance itself can change the way we access the narrative meaning. Okay, so this is a demonstration how that works. Now, if we go next. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to talk about narrative instance and perspective. So narrative perspective refers to the narrator's point of view, otherwise known as vocalization, not the narrator's voice. Okay, so, so educators, we talk about developing your voice as a writer, or the narrative voice is this, but this is not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about point of view or the perspective of the character, or in distance, 
focalization. And according to Jeanette, there are three kinds of focalization. Okay, first kind is zero focalization, which is when the narrators know more than the characters. He may know the facts of all the pro uh, protagonists as well as their thoughts and gestures. So this is a traditional omniscient narrator. So most most teachers know about this term, right? Omniscient. I know it all. I sound like a god, right? The narrator sounds like a god. And this it's, it's, uh, this is also the phrase, little did she know, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect, right? Little did she know. I know more than the character knows. I know everything that's going to happen. So that's zero focalization. Very good. Um, Number two is internal focalization. So that's when the narrator knows as much as the focal character. This character filters information provided to the narrator. He cannot report the thoughts of other characters. Okay, So each character is separate. And the narrator knows as much as the character is willing to reveal. So it's not an omniscient narrator at this point. Um, number three is the external focalization, which is when the narrator knows less than the characters. He acts like a, a camera lens, following the protagonist's actions and gesture from the outside. He is unable to guess their thoughts. So it's also almost as if when the narrator sounds like he's a scientist trying to observe what's happening to the characters, and he says something to the effect of, you know, I wonder what is going on in his mind. Why did this character do this, right? That's your external focalization. So you see the, the narrator perspective or point of view is even more complicated by the fact that Jeanette points out there's actually three kinds. And if you will, um, I think that it's, uh, let me use an example, right? When we Let's say if K and I, or K went to a party, <laughs> and I didn't get to go. So I decided to ask K what happened at the party. If K, right, was at the party and she, she you know, she had experience of the, the party, then I could get access to um, more of the party because she, at that point, she knows what's going, going on. So she's either at the zero focalization or internal focalization, which she actually knows what's happening at the party, um, because she experienced it, and she also knows other characters, right? But if she knows less about the party because she was only looking at the party from outside in, she wasn't participating, and she just says, okay, this is what's happening at the party based on what I saw through the window. That's kind of an example of that external focalization. So I'm relying on Kay to tell me what happened at the party, but depending on where Kay was at the party, the information I get from her will be different, okay? So let's go next. Okay, now on narrative level and metalipsis. Okay, so here's another quote. Writers sometimes also use metalipsis, a process in which the boundary between two narrative levels, which is normally impervious, is breached so as to deliberately blur the line between reality and fiction. Metalipsis is a way of playing with variations in narrative level in order to create an effect of displacement or illusion. This will be a case in which a character or narrator from one level appears on the scene at a higher level, whereas plausibility completely excludes this possibility. Okay, so with all that, that sounds very complicated, but essentially, um, let me ask... Let me ask us first, okay? Uh, Kay and Chris, I don't know. Have you guys seen the film In the Mouth of Madness or heard of it? No, I haven't. Sorry. Hmm, okay. Um, so <laughs> keep trying. <laughs> Is there another movie well, that would work? <laughs> well, I'll give a little bit background on this one okay. and see if you guys see something that demonstrates like mentality. Okay. Right. So In the Mouth of Madness, the character, without giving the whole story away, uh, this man is investigating where the author is. The author disappeared, and they're trying to figure out where he is because apparently when people read this man's book, they seem to exhibit insane behavior. They just try to kill each other, okay? So they try to investigate and try to find where the author was. And the story gets really weird, which is that some part of, this, of the movie, you start to, you drive at real locations, but somehow your car enter into the fictional world that the author constructed by, by writing this book. So you're entering into the fictional world when it's not really logically possible because you're in reality, but somehow you got submerged into the fiction of someone else's writing. So that is an example of metalipsis. Now, I don't know if, if yeah, 
Chris got Sam Neil as uh, Sam O'Neill exactly right. That was the film, right? I don't know if Kay and Chris have you, can you think of another film where the fiction and reality gets really blurred? Oh yeah, there is one, and and you're gonna laugh because that's really where I got the phrase. Little did she, little did she know it was it it was the one. Um, it was about an IRS agent who who was um, hearing the author of a book as she was writing things and was seeing and was seeing things happen. Now I have to I have to think about it was. It was, and it was one of the only dramatic presentations like that Will Ferrell has done. But he was be he was being haunted by he'd hear the the author of the book um, saying saying what was going on in text, and then if there was an accident, the accident would happen to him, and then he he was seeing other things happening to him. It, it was a very interesting movie. Because especially to see what the resolution to see what the resolution was, and about how he met up with um, an English professor to try and track down who exact you know whose voice this exactly was that he kept hearing in his head. Which phone was this again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. It had Will Ferrell. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and, and I think Chris is Oops. googling Will Ferrell right now because how many <laughs> how many movies of Will Ferrell as an IRS agent? <laughs> yeah, are there? Oh, here it is, Stranger Than Fiction. Ah, see, I mean, the title itself is playing with this idea, right? That, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, perfect. That's that's the perfect example. Um, and Chris, did you want to say anything? Yeah, the only thing I, I mentioned here in chat is part of that blending of fiction with reality is is it's not necessarily the same way as uh, Stranger Than Fiction or uh, In the Mouth of Madness, but but even to a some extent, Forrest Gump did that, where they entered Tom Hanks, they went ahead and photoshopped Tom, Hank, Tom Hanks into a lot of historical documentation, so that's how the entire uh -huh. thing with Forrest Gump was they took reality which was history, what really happened, and then they went ahead and they put the fictional character Forrest Gump into um, all this documentation. So, so if you watch Forrest Gump, you'll see that a lot of the cinematography is, is them inserting you know, the Forrest Gump character off to the left of a very historical you know, photograph or uh, black and white footage. They'll, in, in, they'll, they'll go ahead and they'll put a cut scene with, uh, for the, with Tom Hanks running around. Uh, as Forrest Gump in there, so not quite the same thing, but but it was an it's an adaptation of that. Is what right. my comment was. Right. No, 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 no. I understand it. We will call that deception. No. <laughs> That's Photoshop. Photoshop it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in, uh, thank you for explaining that. I guess in that story, though, we're supposed to pretend that this happened. That it, it, it's actually logical for Forrest Gump to go through all these things that happened in all mm -hmm. of his life. Yeah. But we're supposed to pretend that that actually happened within one single narrative. So you're right; it's not quite metalipsis, but I also understand when you say that they're trying to put him in different timeline to mer to blur right reality and fiction. So that's a good example in photo Photoshop. <laughs> okay, so I think I can move on from here. Thank you. All right. So that was Gerard Jeunet, and honestly, that piece is very much worth your time to read. I know some of those critical theory concepts is really hard to understand, but if you just you know take the time to read through it, um, it's it's fascinating. Um, so the next piece we're going to go after is actually uh, the narrative act Wittgenstein and narratology by Henry McDonald. This has more of a philosophical bent to it. Um, um, and uh, it will be a little more difficult reading, but I will try my best to try to explain this piece. Okay, and that was twisting box. But anyway, <laughs> Wittgenstein's language game and the role of the narrator. Okay, so Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, he lived from 1889 to 1951. Okay, he's a very prominent philosopher for developing a philosophy of language and philosophy of mind by examining the functions of language. And what he revealed to us, which has been very influential across all fields, both in humanity and social studies, okay, uh, social sciences, is that language games uh, serve as the conditions for our ability to reason, and that logic is implied by language games. So you're not really studying logical structure, looking at language, but more as 
the, the language itself, as you look at it, as the mimetic representation, implies that logic. So I'll explain that in a bit, okay? So Henry MacDonald, the author of this article, he applies Wittgenstein's concept of language then to explore the function of the narrator on constructing the meaning of a literary text. So let's go next. Okay. So now on Wittgenstein on language as human action. So McDonald tells us, Wittgenstein conceived of language at its most basic level as forms of human action. These forms, or language games, could not be rationalized or grounded. On the contrary, it was the use of language that provided the conditions for of possibility of reason. Okay, so language come before reason, essentially. Okay, or it, it happened at the same time, but I want to say in the sense of there are conditions for reason. Without language, there is no reasoning. Right? Breakdowns in reason, including philosophical difficulties, could consequently be attributed to misunderstanding about how language worked. Now. For some of us educators who teach writing, okay, sometimes you've heard probably in textbook they talk about this or other, other teachers talk about this. When we say that writing is thinking, well, the philosopher Wittgenstein would agree with you there. In fact, that concept came from him. <laughs> this idea that when you are writing that you're thinking and thinking is writing, there's the relationship because language serves as the conditions for your ability to be even able to reason, okay? This is something that, that's, that is very important that he has given us. So we can go next. Okay, so now on logic, on language revealing logic. So here's a couple more quotes from McDonald. Despite the concrete, almost observable character of our patterns of language use, they, mun they must not be confused with cognitive content or knowledge as found in classical scientific explanations. For Wittgenstein, all explanations are themselves part of a logical or conceptual framework. They are not explanations of that uh, uh, frame. Framework, okay? Logic is not a type of explanation. It cannot be stated but only shown. It is what is revealed through or seen in the workings of language. So before I continue, because this is really confusing here, right? Um, when we talk about language, he's not really referring to what he's saying, the knowledge, like concrete knowledge. So knowledge is already concrete. It's the object based on uh, language and reasoning, okay? So knowledge. So he is saying that all explanations using language are, are, are part of the con logical or conceptual framework. So I'm going to harken back to Kay, who use, uses a lot of the um, epistemic frame. And Kay, would you, would you mind explaining what epistemic frame is for us? Uh, um, basically, yeah. We use epistemic frame a lot when it comes to game-based learning is because it seems, to, it seems to be what impacts or has the most influence in explaining why we're doing certain games, and the epistemic and the epistemic frame is really setting setting the game up in a framework of a certain profession. Say, because Chris does accounting, you know, we love to find games like um, the MMOs, like World of Warcraft, that have an auction house where you have to keep track of your of you know your goods sold and what and exactly what your your material you're going to use for it, and it, and it makes it and it makes it real nice. And in this epistemic frame, we expect you to be using the vocabulary of an accountant to do this. The material of an you know the, the material of an accountant. Now, if we would have you say going into another game and looking at the online interaction, um, a sociology class could do it. And the epistemic frame they would be using would be that of of a sociologist. Uh, and I mean, we've done things with um, a microbiology game that we built. We had them going in as epi epidemiologists, and, and so that's what the epistemic frame. How are you going to fit them in, in how this community of practice and how they see either the interaction or, or basically reality? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I put you on the spot. That was really well explained. Thank you. <laughs> so, epistemology in philosophy is the study of knowledge or how do we know what we know how what is the process by way of us accessing knowledge how did we access knowledge that how question is the focal point of epistemology so epistemic frame writes off on the the notion of epist uh, epistemology basically 
it is that frame, right, that, that Kay explained to us. It's a framing that um, that influence the way we access knowledge, though it's before knowledge, because knowledge is already content. So you're using a frame, and this framework, right, help you access knowledge in certain ways. So we're always getting filtered content, if you will. Now, what Wittgenstein is saying here, which is revolutionary when, when he discussed this, okay, and it's still revolutionary now, is that language, the nature of language itself, they are all frames, okay? All explanation. <laughs> They're all conceptual frames. You can't get out of frames. Language by nature frames things. So this idea that we can get to truth and knowledge, we have to acknowledge what language is doing and how it is influenced the way we access things. If language is thinking, then we also need to understand that language also impose, right, a certain type of structure onto the way we see things. It's a framing. So McDonald explains a little more, right? He says, that is why Wittgenstein declared that we must take off our conceptual blinders and see through language as explanation to the multitudinous uh, ways in which it worked, okay? Don't think but look, he exclaims impatiently at one point in the philosophical investigations. So this is kind of a contradiction in a sense. So we think in language we discuss things in language, we think of concept in language. So what Wittgenstein is asking us to do is quite difficult. <laughs> but he's trying to make us understand that there are concepts behind our language where structured language is structured with conceptual framework. We really can't get out of concepts, right? In theory, when you use language. If we can go next. Okay. So narration is a uh, narrative act. Okay. So here's a little more McDonald. Um, he says, for the study of fictional narrative discourse, the primary object of criticism is not the story, but what is preposed, presupposed by any story, the narrator. So it's funny, right? He is saying narrative discourse, going back, the word discourse means how is the narrative organized? It's the telling part, right? It's how the grammar or the organization of the story itself, discourse, okay, the telling of it. But something is interesting that he's saying here. When we're looking at uh, stories, we're not supposed to look at stories. What, what Wittgenstein is trying to get us to do is actually look at the narrator or the person speaking because of that relationship, right, between language use. So I'll explain a little more. The narrator may be regarded as a form of action that constitutes the conditions of possibility of the narrator, a uh, narrative. So in the sense that language, right, constitute um, or the uh, language constitute possibilities, right? There's conceptual framework to accessing knowledge. Now, when we read a fictional story, we're reading a story always through a narrator. So how we understand the narrative is always through the narrative frame. So the narrator is actually a, a form of narrative action because he imposes a certain way to interpret the event, right? But he, uh, McDonald continues, as Jeanette's work has made clear, all narratives are in the first person, whatever the point of view of the narrator, so that the primary condition of possibility of any narrative is a person doing the telling. So we can't get away from that. A narrative is not purely a story, but in the sense that the narrator who's telling us, we are always going to be fine by what the narrator is saying, right? So that telling part is what we're being held on to. Even if we often, for psychological or other reasons, ignore the presence of the narrator while reading, that presence is nonetheless a logical uh, presupposition of our reading a narrative in the first place. So we can't get away from that. There is logic to the narrator who uh, serves as a conceptual framework, or if you will, the epistemic framing <laughs> of how we understand the narrative. Okay, so next, please. All right, so narrative discourse constructs the narrator. A little more on that, okay? The narrator, however, must be conceived not just as a personal presence, but as a form of action that operates at the level radically disproportionate to the action of the story. The narrative act has, indeed, a status independent not just of the content of the telling, story, and characters, but of any final meaning of the story. The association of the latter with the author is nowadays considered naive. Right? So if you say um, you can understand the meaning of the story by understanding the author, 
um, any teacher who teaches literary analysis would say, well, that's silly, okay? You can't really access the author, and just because you know the author doesn't mean that the author can help you understand the meaning of a story because you're doing interpretation anyway, right? But McDonald also emphasizes this. It is, in fact, no less naive to associate such meaning with the narrator. For what we call the narrator is not a fixed entity capable of dictating a determinate meaning, but it's rather the discourse produced by the act of narrating, a discourse which makes meaning and cannot designate it. So in itself, the narrator is not a thing, it's not really a person. Um, it's again, it's a self-discourse. It's constructed by discourse. Um, <laughs> It also have layers and layers of meaning. So if all this sounds difficult, the point is that when we are reading a story, it's not just ourselves that's reading. We are also going through the lens of the narrator, and the narrator is also not really a person, right? A narrator is actually a construct based on the way the discourse is organized, the way the story is organized. So the narrator is actually just an action. So when we're reading a text, we're going through the narrator, the narrative action to understand the meaning of a text. So it gets complicated. Okay? So I'm going to go next. <laughs> well, it gets even more complicated when you start thinking about games and who's the narrator in the game and what the influence of you playing it, if you're playing it with other people, you know, what the meta game is. I I think <laughs> I think this is very interesting. Oh, good. Now we see, uh, uh, yeah, you're leading us to that, that big finale, right, with digital games. But you're right. See, now that we see some implication with narratology, now we're thinking about what are games doing, right? So <laughs> the third text is The Hero's Three-Part Journey by Michael Webster. This text actually is a lecture by, by Dr. Michael Webster um, talking about Vladimir Propp. I would have liked to cover Vladimir Prop, but it's a whole book, so I decided to use a secondary text to help you understand what Vladimir Prop is talking about. But again, uh, just, just to remind everybody, uh, the books, the primary text, all the links are actually on our page this week. So if you want to challenge yourself and actually read the primary text, by all means, please do so. Okay? But I'm going to go through this lecture. And also, by the way, this is a game that I really, really like. It's actually an old game from 2003. It is called A Closed World. It is created by MIT students, uh, MIT Game Lab, I believe. And it's a game where a character is trying to deal with his demons, and he's, a, he's trying to confront his uh, homosexuality, okay? And throughout the demons that he encounters, he is also using rhetorical principles like Logos, uh, uh, pathos and ethos to try to address the monsters as he's going through. So this game is a beautiful combination of rhetoric and also addressing a, a complicated topic uh, regarding homosexuality. Okay, so that's one game actually as an interactive fiction as well. So I'm going to go next from here. Alright, so let me give you a little bit of introduction on prop and then we'll discuss what exactly does prop mean by the word narrative function. Okay, so Vladimir Prop is a Russian formalist who identified plot components that exist in Russian folk tales. So plot is the organization of the story, right? And we talk about discourse as a more formal name for the word plot. Um, it's 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 a bit tough for uh, to distinguish that, but I don't have time to discuss that right now. <laughs> but understand that plot and discourse is associated. Okay, so in morphology of the folk tales. Prop presents 31 functions or plot components that are present in folktales and shows sequence in which the 31 functions can be arranged. Besides Prop, Arnold von Gennep and Joseph Campbell have also examined the structures of folktales and myths and developed their own morphologies. In fact, Campbell was heavily influenced by von Gennep before he created the Hero's Journey. So Hero's Journey is actually a combination of uh, von Gennep's work as well as Carl Jung's a psychoanalytic theory. Okay, so it's very interesting how Hero's journey came about. But Michael Webster explained to us that Prop defined a function in a story as an event interpreted according to its consequences. In other words, a function is a plot motif or event in the story. Prop ex uh, claimed that the sequence of functions is limited and that the functions always occur in the same order. According to him, a tale may skip functions, but it cannot shuffle their unvarying order. So out of the 31 uh, functions, 
he lays them out. Okay. Now a story doesn't have to have all 31 functions. He, uh, the story can actually skip a few of them. And specifically, I should talk about folk tales, right? A folk tale doesn't have to have all 31 functions, but the order in which the uh, functions are organized according to prop does not marry and should not marry. Okay, so let's go next. All right, this is a little bit hard to see, um, and let's see if we can go through this with just this small screenshot. If this was hard to see, um, again, the hero's three-part journey, that lecture note, is also on our page. If you want to click on that and look at it, please, please do. This is Michael Webster's form, okay? So he explains the hero's three-part journey through all three authors, through, through Joseph Campbell, Von Genup, and Prop, okay? So Campbell, you have the three stages, separation, initiation, return. Von Genup, separation, transition, incorporation. So he changed the name of it to turning it, uh, Campbell changed it to initiation, return. Now Prop, <laughs> my hero here, <laughs> 31 functions. Now those 31 functions, Webster help us understand the relationship there by showing you that those 31 function from function 1 through 11 um, you can organize it under the section called separation you have function 12 through 19 under initiation and you have function 20 to 31 under return so props you know morphology is far more complex but it's also a bit harder to understand okay but it's but uh, by the way Vladimir Pop's work is now heavily employed by narrative designers who work for uh, AAA uh, game studios. They discovered the complexity of these folk tales, and they are trying to transcend out of doing the normal uh, hero's journey, right? Because a lot yeah. of games already have hero's journey. And, and Kay, you want to say something? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We, no, we see that so often about it, that it's. Hero's Journey is sword and board, and th and they're starting to all look the same. Um, right. Quite honestly, in an anthropology in an anthropology of folklore class by um, an instructor that we both know who teaches anthropology, um, I went into her class and we actually w had the students pull out different video games to to see what basic what the basic plots were. And what kind of folklore was coming over, and we just got hit with it again and again. It was it was that we weren't seeing any real, we weren't seeing any real interesting variation. Now the, her students were just doing a sample. You know, they just had to go pick one, bring it in, and explain it. But we sat in the class and we just went, huh. We're not seeing that that our students are being exposed to to much much more on their on their own. Then, then the hero's journey showing up in yet another one. It's hero's journey in space. You know, it's hero's journey <laughs> medieval times. Hero's journey added, you know, added time warping thing. You know, uh, right. we just kept seeing it. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit formulaic, right? It's starting to get dull. Um, so I think the narrative designers are very conscious, uh, conscientious of this. So they are uh, trying to apply different ways to do it. And they have found the Vladimir prop. They were excited to find Vladimir prop. Like, oh my gosh, you know, here's the folktale functions. And by the way, Vladimir prop is not the only one as well. There, there's lots more, but I only focus on these three uh, 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 folk folklorists to kind of help us see different variations. Okay, so let's go away from this chart. Okay, thank you. So let me first explain to you props differentiation of, of dramatis personae. So dramatis personae is actually the seven roles that any character can assume in the story. So he said there are actually seven roles that he has discovered. So keep in mind, um, you know, uh, prop didn't create this, this topology or this morphology really. Um, by inductive reasoning. He didn't just sit there and go, logically speaking, there should be these elements. What he did was he spent years and years and years of his life, dedicated his life, you know, studying Russian folktales. So what you see here is based on what he has discovered in Russian folktales. This doesn't mean that it's applied across the board. I mean, it's argued that this applies to all folktales, but we already discussed that sometimes uh, Asian uh, Eastern folk tales might have different variations, okay? But this, uh, just keep in mind, this is a Russian version and also applies to Western uh, mythology. So he has villain, donor, helper, princess, dispatcher, hero, and false hero. 
So um, I think that Campbell calls that anti-hero, right? It's a false hero or anti-hero. So there are some parallels there. Okay, did you want to say something there? Oh, no, no. I, I was just agreeing and enjoying it. Okay. <laughs> so it's not great that someone spells out seven roles. Like, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, now I'm going to go next from here. Okay. So I, I can't cover it. I can't actually put all three and function on the screen. Well, I'm going to start from a basic place, which is preparation. <laughs> so these, so think of it this way, okay? Under the preparation section, we're not saying that you use every one of these seven functions to design a story. It's more as if you're picking one of the seven to design a story. So some of the examples are, the first one is one of the members of the family absences himself from home. Second one is an interdiction or ban is addressed to the hero. Or the third one is the interdiction is violated. The villain usually enters the story here. The fourth one, the villain makes an attempt at reconnaissance. So you see, you're not, you're not doing all of them. But you choose maybe one or two as a starting point for your story. That's the preparation part. So if we can go next. Okay. So, Chris, if you don't mind, go ahead and click on the link to the web page. Okay. So if you can scroll down a bit for us, and it probably might take a little bit of uh, uh, zooming in for this part. Thank you so much. Okay. So I kind of quoted that preparatory, uh, uh, preparatory section, right? Um, oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> really huge. Um, the next section you see that you have the next plot, which is plot set in motion, and there are several ways to get the story going. So you have uh, 8 through 15. Some of them, like, for example, the villain causes harm or injury to a member of a family. See, that event or that function can initiate the plot, right? So move the plot forward. Or, for example, number 10, the seeker or hero agrees to or decides upon to counter actions, right? So some of these can be mixed, okay? Just not all of them. You don't use every single one of these. Um, number 13, the hero reacts to the actions of the future donor. Number 14, the hero acquires the use of a magical agent, and so forth. So you see that these are functions, right? They call them functions because if you place them in a story, it initiates a certain way the plot can go. And we can go a little further down. Thank you. Struggle of victory over villain, end of lack and return. The hero and villain join in direct combat. The hero is branded. The villain is defeated. See, those are possibilities. So without me covering every single one of these, think of the function as possibilities that you can have in the story. Obviously, you're not going to put every possibility in a story because, again, you want to make the story unique. So different combinations, it's almost as if um, you're playing a puzzle, right, puzzle pieces. You put those puzzles together, you create a new type of puzzle. So maybe you'll find props, um, uh, functions interesting. This is one way to design a story. And yeah, so I'm not going to go cover more. So I think I can skip along here. Thank you, Chris. OK. So the next a couple of texts, and these are actually just graphics. I want to show you some of this story design, OK? So the first one is called Story Structure by John Paris. The second one is called Choose Your Own Adventure Book as Directed Graph. So what John Paris and Sean Michael Reagan has done for us is actually create graphical representation of story structures. And I've just covered Gerard Jeanette, right? And I just explained to you about Wittgenstein. And the truth is, you can have infinite forms. You can have infinite narrative forms. So keep that in mind. But these are just a few that people have discovered that they use graphical representation of. But this is not the endless of all uh, plot design or, or story structures. Okay? So please go next. Okay. First one, and I took a few of a John Paris' uh, uh, page. So he has seven or eight of them there. But this one is uh, called the diamond branching, which is you start the story from the left-hand side, and it goes to the next story node, right, so next event. And there's two different directions that the story can go. So you have the one on the top and one on the bottom. But somehow, no matter, the, if you go either route, you still end up at the same place and you have the same conclusion. So that's called diamond branching. So we can go next. Okay. This one he calls a petal. Oh, this is complicated, right? 
So the starting place is at the center, but there are four directions that the story can go. And you can see on the right-hand side, he kind of shows you the directionality. So you have, you can go one and two going back to the starting point, three and four. So if you think of those adventure games, the good old cave explorer games, where you can go to different caves and come back to the same place, I think WoW has certain structures like this, like the pedal, but this is one, another type of story structure where you kind of circle back to the beginning. Okay, so next. Thank you. This one is small, but I think we can just, we only have to really look at the, the, the structure here. This is called the diamond, or actually story field, uh, story field structure. The story beginning is at the very top um, of the, the field, which is this, this uh, uh, rectangle here, or square, really. The bottom is a story ending, and then those fields, which those little blocks, the elements, any point within the field can be a potential starting point. So yes, he drew an arrow showing though at the very top the story begins, but technically any part of those little field can start a story, right? And at the bottom he says any point within the field can be a potential end point as well. So in that sense, there's many different locations where the story can begin. He also gave us a little addendum. He says, certain story elements can be inferred and an entire storyline can be determined, perhaps even a different one that, original, that that originally intended, right? So in any case, you see that there are different paths that you can create based on this kind of structure. But essentially, the field analogy means that there's many different branching that you can go and different story ending and different story beginnings, okay? So i go go next. All right. This is a circular one. Circular one, I believe circular stories happen a lot, actually, in Eastern uh, storylines, the Eastern myth, right? But you have the story note, and it, it just kind of go in a big old loop. <laughs> so no matter where you start, it always go back to the beginning. That's just the basic uh, circle structure, okay? So that's pretty simple. So next. All right. This is really hard to see. So... Uh, Chris, if you don't mind going to the page for me again. Yeah, this required room at certain parts. Yeah, yeah. We can't see all this chart, but again, the image is, the link is on the page. So if you guys are interested, just click on the link and you'll see this, okay? This is created by Sean Michael uh, Reagan, and I am impressed by this. What he did was he was very much in love with one of his Choose Your Own Adventure games. And he decided to create this nice graphical chart on exactly what the choices are, what the options are in the CYOA book. So you see he actually numbered these, these nodes, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can keep going down a little more. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see all this. But there's places where he kind of organized and he goes escape, shrunk, Witch dies. After that, there's pneumonia or Jane disappears. Don't look back. Shrunk, jumped to death, eaten by cat, narrowly escaped, dies in tomb. So you see, these are possibilities. But you notice in the CYOA, which is a demonstration of a nonlinear plot design, notice that it doesn't follow those exact structures that we talked about earlier, which is present in traditional stories, right? But in an if structure like this, there are many different ways that you can construct those structures. And it's just refreshing to see one, someone actually plotting this entire chart out to show us some possibility of how to design this. Okay, so I think, I think we can go next. Okay, this is the last piece. I, I'm not going to go through every single part of this, but this is called The Narrativity of Computer Games by Britta Nietzel. And this is from Bretta Nietzsche. This is almost like an encyclopedic, uh, encyclopedic uh, entry published on the Living Handbook of Narratology. <laughs> so if you, are, uh, if you are interested in narratology and you have lots of time to spend, I recommend that you study the Living Handbook of Narratology. You will get lost in the encyclopedic information that's on that page. Okay? And this actually is the Stanley Parable. Stanley Parable is a game that I use with my philosophy students to teach uh, uh, the determinism and freedom, or, or free will, to understand if the character actually has free will when they're playing this game. This is also a type which is almost uh, CYOA, which is you choose certain dis um, 
decisions that will lead you to certain consequences. And you see the screen that says, let's begin again, let's begin again, let's begin again. That's because you die very, very frequently, um, no matter what decision you make. So it's kind of a frustrating game. But anyway, let me move on from here. Okay. So before I discuss this text, I want to give you guys a brief note about narratology versus ludology. Okay. So uh, during summer 2014 session of the Megan Book Club, um, we actually did address a debate that was between narratologists and ludologists, specifically on the controversy of whether uh, or not games are actually stories. Okay. So this debate is still kind of going on. It's starting to get dated. No one really want to talk about it, but people still think like this, okay? <laughs> so since this entire presentation really frames our discussion of what digital games are doing, also what interactive fiction games are doing, um, through the lens of narratology, I thought that it would be wise for us to kind of revisit this debate lightly, okay? So we can kind of get a gist of what's happening, and then we can move on from that to really apply narratology to, to study games, okay? So let's go next. All right, so Nietzsche uh, uh, tells us, okay, so she says, the spectrum of approaches in this debate, the so-called ludology versus narratology debate, arranged from euphoric affirmation of the new possibility of storytelling, um, and she's talking about Murray there, to outright denial of the narrative quality of computer games, Eskel Lennon, 2001. On the other hand, this criticism toward the view that computer game is one possible form of future storytelling had a political dimension motivated by the fear that established disciplines such as literary or film studies will incorporate computer games into their own territories, treating them as derivatives of literature or film. Now this fear, it's understandable though, right? Game study scholars really want to create a field where we are allowed to study Video games respect the medium and try to understand the medium. They were afraid that if you try to play, uh, approach and say games are stories, then it becomes under the wheelhouse of literary studies or English studies, right, or philosophical studies. So what they're trying to do is say, no, 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 games are not stories and let us tell you why. It's a new kind of medium. There's different things about it. So for this author, it seems to be a political play to try to divorce the discussion that games are narrative um, in order to save games under the game studies discipline, okay? Now, on the other hand, this critical position argued that computer games are first and foremost games and that methods developed for the study of literature and film are insufficient to deal with their specifics. And that is partially true as well. The theories that came out of literary studies and film studies does not, does not, or do not adequately address what's happening in games as well, okay? Because they are focused on film, and film is a different medium than games, so it's understandable that there's this debate on, on whether or not we can study games as stories. Okay, so next. Okay, so here is the big argument, and I really like the way this is written here. So it said, both positions simply treating the computer game as narrative or negating any relation between narratives and games whatsoever are too narrow in scope. In the first case, there is a danger of overlooking differences between games and narratives. Okay? In second position, by contrast, risk discarding similarities between computer games and narratives. Not every game has the same structure. Computer games uh, oops, sorry, computer games being structured differently from ball games, for instance. Common to both positions is that they one-sidedly isolate one single dimension to the exclusion of all others. An approach which fails to acknowledge the specifics of the computer, namely the fact that the computer is a hybrid medium that integrates various forms of media, and in so doing dissolves distinctions between them. That is why it's so threatening. <laughs> computer games has visuals, like film, but they also have interactivity that films doesn't, but most films do not have, right? And it also have narrative elements. So it has multiple mediums conforming to one. So to study it, the truth is, do game studies, you can't just apply one disciplinary focus to understand what games are doing. You really need to do an interdisciplinary approach, listen to other disciplines, as well as assert your own, to really do justice by what exactly games are supposed to be doing. Also, the discussion, uh, going back, what we said was the narratology versus ludology debate is trying to address whether games are stories. But I started this presentation by explaining to you that a story 
It's not a narrative, nor is it narration, right? A story is the telling, the process, the events. Well, actually not the telling, but the events that's correlated in the story, and the narration is actually the telling of it. So when you say games are not stories, what are we talking about here? Are you talking about the narrative form, the final form? Are you talking about the telling part of it? Are you telling that? Are you saying that games does not have events, right? Because obviously games have certain events in it. So when you say games are not stories, that's very confusing to narratologists who clearly distinguishes the difference between story, narrative, and narration. Okay. So I'm going to go uh, next from here. So that's our brief discussion on narratology versus ludology. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about actually narrativity and games. So we got that out of the way. I'm going to talk about the difference between abstract versus mimetic uh, narrativity in games. So computer games show a wide variety of forms of genre. They can be subdivided into abstract and mimetic games. Games of skills, um, gishiklik, uh, kite spiel, which demand dexterity from the players, and puzzle games, which is a dunk, a dunk spiel, which demand cognitive skills and decision making. Okay, so you see that one is First, the abstract, which is um, abstract versus mimetic. But mimetic, one more time, is representation, okay? Representation of reality in someone. Abstract means it doesn't have to represent reality, right? It, it can't be its own creation. Um, these groups overlap. Some games use abstract graphic elements that have to be arranged in a certain order or assembled like a puzzle. In other games with abstract graphics, that dexterity of the players is important, as when the game elements have to be thrown or shot. Related to the latter are so-called shooters, which demand dexterity in a representational game world. So in a representational game world, when you're playing, for example, um, boy, I'm trying to think of some shooter games that's off the top of my head, but most shooter games are, you know, you can see actual soldiers, you can see guns, especially players really want to see real guns represented in games. So in that sense, you can call those mimetic forms of games. But if you talk about, for example, Super Mario Brothers, right, that's, that's <laughs> more abstract. Yeah, <laughs> jumping those levels is, you know, versus, versus something else. I mean, even if you're just looking at Halo, you just have this idea of you being, of you being the shooter. Versus, you know, jumping levels up and down <laughs> for, right. for Mario Brothers. Right. And, uh, Kay or Chris, uh, would you say, th uh, because I'm not, you know, expert like you guys on WoW, would you say that there's mimetic um, forms, mimetic representation in WoW at all? I, I, I don't know. What, what, would you, what would you say, Chris? I mean, you can put yourself into a first-person shooter position. Hmm. And and I will tell you they they now have a feature where you can actually take a selfie from the screen and oh. and tweet it out. <laughs> okay, okay, but there's no reality re represented at all, right? That that the entire well environment is completely abstract. Would you say? Yeah, that it's 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 very uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely more abstract. So um, there isn't any any real in it other than, you know, what the players bring uh, in their discussions and stuff like that and trade channel and stuff like that. But um, okay. in the game itself, there's nothing that, that models any current events or is modeled after anything um, in the real world. It's own little, you know, world. But yeah, like Kay said, they are implementing some real world concepts like the selfie and <laughs> things like that. And, right. and you can always move, and you can change your camera angle. So that's the other thing about it. So Now, we could probably argue, though, probably argue that if you take screenshots from external world, and I don't know how that works, but if you take screenshots of external world and put it into the well environment, that that's maybe a type of metalipsis. Um, it's kind of a hard argument, <laughs> but blurring reality with fiction, right? That, that blurring, I'm not really sure, but it's very interesting to study that. So, um, and I can move on from this slide. Thank you. So now, talking about degrees of narrativity, I'm going to talk about players, okay? So as to the narrativity of computer games, it is also important to consider whether the player's role is to direct a single game element, anthropomorphic or otherwise, or a group of elements. While computer role-playing games, action adventures, and action games fall in the first category, um, various sorts of sports games, economic simulations, or strategy games, in which teams or armies are directed, belong to the second, right? So 
The player role can direct single game element or group of elements. That also is a narrat uh, narrative action. Okay, so this is a nice way to show how the player, like the narrator, if you will, just, there's an analogy, right? So the narrative, the narrator is applying narrative action. The player is also doing that, um, and the experience just changes based on what they get to manipulate in the game. So next. Okay, now talking about degrees, degree narrativity of games, degrees, okay? So when the interest lies in the narrativity of computer games, it is common not to include all types of computer games. Different genres of computer games have different degrees of narrativity. Thus, most abstract computer games lack narrative qualities since narrativity presupposes presence of characters, event, setting, right? So when you say that games are not stories, whatever one means by that, okay? What I like, what Marie L Ryan Lohr kind of uh, Marie Lohr Ryan kind of tells us here is that remember that narrativity includes characters, events, and setting. So sometimes when a game is overly abstract, it's hard to see that. But you probably it'll be hard to find. I think that when a game is completely abstract, that it doesn't even have characters or event. So you know, it depends on examples. But I can think probably there are abstract games where they, it lacks all three things. It's just a kind of an iffy, uh, um, what we say, a murky, murky boundary there. When you say event, which is something happening, right? A game has something happening, so therefore, you know, there's still some narrative quality to that game. So if we can go next. All right. So we're almost down to the last bits, but we started off with a discussion on the morphology of myths, right? Morphology of folktale from, from prop. We uh, studied from Jeanette, you know, the narrative elements uh, in a narrative, right? So what composes a narrative? How does it influence the narrative structure? So now we're going to talk about how that works in the game. So the progression of the virtual story in action adventure games is programmed according to the narrative structure that Todorov has called the mythological story structure. So Todorov we didn't cover extensively, and it wasn't part of the text. But information is also on this page, okay? So mythological story structure. Games of the mythological structure provide players or their avatars with a clearly defined aim that marks the end state of the game, so the final goal. Your final goal is to rescue the princess and Mario Brothers, right? So that's the end state. The path to this aim can be arranged differently from one game to another, so we learn from prop, right? There are many different ways to construct that thing. A classical narrator can use a linear path to this end, starting at the initial situation, a linear chain of events, and action leads to the end of, of the story. So when we say classical narrative, think of Aristotle. We covered Aristotle uh, last week talking about the three-part drama, beginning, middle, end. That's your classic narrative, right? A game organized like this offers a very limited degree of freedom, and, and they're talking about specifically linear, linear stories, right? That the player, she does not have any choice, which makes the game rather boring, or more precisely, there's no game at all because a game must offer at least two options. <laughs> so if a game follows a linear storyline, it does get stale. Or after you play it through, right, you play it through one time, some players don't like to go back and replay that game because it follows that narrative or linear storyline. Okay, so next. Okay, a little more on myth. So... As in myths, no clear origin can be identified. So you notice that when you start a story, and you can also examine those functions by prop, it doesn't tell you when and where exactly they begin, or it doesn't tell you too much about ba uh, the hero's background if we start with the hero. The origin, it's also hard to determine where the myth comes from. That's what we mean by as in myths, no clear origin can be identified. There are theories behind this because myths originally are based on an oral tradition, right? It's told, it's passed down um, uh, by storytelling, by narration. Therefore, the origin kind of shift every time we retell the story. Uh, that's why probably myths have no clear origin, okay? It has also been uh, observed that these multiple stories and story fragments add to the narrativity of computer games. So the lovely part is that because there are multiple stories, right, as story fragments, that also can add to the beauty, the narrativity of computer games. It shows you that games can actually be interpreted as narratives because it doesn't have, if the game doesn't usually have clear origin to begin with. And that's usually following that mythical structure, right? So let's go next. Okay, and here's our last piece, okay? 
The second underlying narrative structure that can be found in action adventure games is the nociological structure, a form that does not provide the players with clearly defined aim. So it's different than the previous one where we're talking about the, the mythological structure, which is at the end, you know you're going to rescue the princess, right? This is the kind that doesn't have it. So Todorov defines the Parsifal Saga as the prototype of the nociological narrative. These narratives are about the search for meaning, and in contrast to mythological narratives, have an ending that is unforeseeable from the beginning of the narration and tends to point back into the past. This becomes obvious in Todorov's second example, the detective novel, in which the protagonist tries to find out what had happened. So stories that go backwards in time, right? In any case, I have to end it here because we have gone on pretty long today. And I only gave snippets. So if you felt I didn't cover any of those authors completely, there's a good reason for that because I want to give you a sampler plate, if you will, of the amazing amount of narrative theories that are out there. Okay, And I want to kind of bring it back to Kay and Chris, if you guys want to give us um, any comments about this. And we can go to the next slide for the, the question screen. Yeah. So... Based on what we kind of discussed today, can you guys see how any of that can help us dissect any games that you guys have seen? Oh, oh, not only dissect games, but but help us win. I mean, if we are going to have our interactive fiction competition, I think we're going to have to cut pieces of this out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and edit and like little snippets. We'll give them five minutes here, five five minutes there. But I think that that this week really really lets people, they, you can take from what you talked about, the narrative, and think about how this relates to games. And I know one of, one of our, our other guest speakers um, who was on us, for, who was with us, um, what makes a game good, I think he does something similar to what you do in your courses, which is have the students game, I mean, go into the game to learn about the, ele the elements of a narrative. And and also and I don't I'm not sure that he's having his students write the narrative of a game, but mm -hmm. this for me is really interesting because a lot of what we're seeing right now is focused on gamification, and how do you right. take some game elements and let's have the teachers go ahead and and make the you know let's have the teachers go ahead and and make a certain part of their their course game like. What I like about this is for all of the kids that we have playing Minecraft. I, an educator can look at at narrative through this and then say, oh, this is how I can use Minecraft to have students construct stories. Or I can have the students construct their own stories and I can go back and I can show them exactly what, what they were doing. I mean, even when, when we use two, two students who are, uh, who are daughters of our friend, Mousy Moose and Giraffe, 619, because we only use their screen names, mm -hmm. going back and having them explain how they decided to develop things and actually what, what was the, the narrative they were thinking about when they were creating that castle for us. I mean, I think that this starts giving a framework for educators to look at, hey, games aren't just about just, just you know, you're shooting something and that's it. And, and how rich digital games could be once, once you start to learn how, how they could be used. Right, right. And I think when, if we are going to do, and hopefully you know, down the road if we can get to do that interactive fiction contest, each of these elements can even be explored more. Each of the authors, so I can spend hours and all, <laughs> hours and hours just talking about each author. You know, um, I, I didn't even get to talk about the four type of narrators according to Jeanette. It, there's so much to talk about. But yes, these are tools for us to understand the complexity of games. And I like to go back and I like to reference uh, Rafe Coaster, um, who said that you know. The reason why a game is fun is because it's complex, like a complex puzzle. So when the game, when you have figured out the game, it's no longer very fun. And he uses a tic-tac-toe example to show how stupid the game is, right? He's saying it's not very complex. It loses its fun after you figure out exactly, you know, how it works, right? So when you say that, so, okay, when you say that narratology is very interesting, part of the reason is because it's so complex. 
It's our hard oh, fun yeah. that you were talking about. <laughs> it is. And, and I have to say that not only that, but the whole time I'm thinking about it, it is, you know, having, having been a, a dungeon, you know, a dungeon master in D&D and coming up with the quest. Mm -hmm. and, and thinking and you know like reading and thinking about things I, I think I think that that can work so well and, and like I said we might be a little bit obsessed these days about how do you how do you take these game elements and put this in a non-game environment and and it's beautiful to see you know to see the typology already done when it when it comes to the narrative portion of it so and and Great that you reference that back to back to your track, you know, uh, particularly on gamification, which is you know it's it's still a good activity if done well. Um, but a lot of the gamification conference, especially the gamification research network, has started to pay attention to the importance of narratives. So one of the arguments, uh, uh, especially in marketing, right, there's using gamification to sell sell uh, products. They're saying we need to figure out how to market products using complex narrative forms. They're saying this, they're not quite understanding it yet, but you know, <laughs> narratologists, you know, studying it for hundreds and hundreds of years trying to figure this out. So it will take a lot of time studying this. But I think for educators, if they're willing to take on this challenge, we could reinvent our classroom just by understanding oh, yeah. the narrative elements, you know? Now, beyond just points and, you know, leadership boards. We need a story to kind of hold everything together. That's one of my criticisms is sometimes when game location is not done well, there is not a very good coherent story, right, to keep everything together. And there's a lack of meaning in the activity that we're trying to do. And and that's and that's really I would say that's kind of what we what we saw with when Matthew Miller gave his presentation for us on the other track, you know we started and we put the question up there because it it started to be wait a second you know um, we were like okay we're pretty sure he's going to give us good gamification elements then we started to to listen to him and like no he's made his he's made a narrative for his whole class. You know that that they're playing that as the, as they're going along and doing these other things, and that's the other thing. If you read Lee Sheldon's book, you can see how much he is talking about putting in the narrative, putting right. in the story, and right. and while he has the gamification elements, a yes, story for him is huge. You're not getting a name of a guild. You're not getting deciding on on what's the role of the characters and stuff like that without having without having a, a narrative to to interact with. Right. And the last piece, and we've talked for a while today. So the last piece, I want to remind everybody. Again, when we say story, and it's okay with this confusion, but I hope today, if anything, I've I've shown you this is that. There's levels to a story, and really, story just refers to events. It's not even talking about the diegetic movement, you know, when you're telling a story, right? Or the final form, the form itself of a story, because a story doesn't even refer to the form, like the pictures, uh, the graphs I've shown you guys, right? So when we say that we want to put story in a game, what we really should be saying is that we want to put narrativity in a game, right? Which incorporates events organization of elements, right, the telling of it, and also form. We have to consider form. What uh, uh, Henry Jenkins talked about, narrative architecture, the way the, the, the story is formed to move forward uh, game, game forms, to make innovative games. And, and that's the thing about it, especially if we, uh, we're also looking at, you know, at alternate reality games. And you need that part too. And, and figuring out the story of an alternate reality game is actually kind of the is the most fun part. <laughs> whether whether you're doing it as an educator and you're doing it for your class, or when you're having your students do it, it's just wonderful to hear to hear and see how how they're co they're coming up with it, the narrative portion of it. Right. Exactly. And I'm, I'm done for my end today. <laughs> I'll stop torturing you guys with hard theories. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. I found it really useful. I especially like the taxonomy piece as we're uh, working together on, on a couple different projects, especially in assessment. So I really like looking at the different uh, breakouts of all the, all the typologies and taxonomies. So that, that kind of 
makes me go, ah, oh, I see spreadsheets are in my future. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, I, I teach accounting, so that's, that's actually fine. So anyway, thank you all for watching. Have a great uh, weekend. Happy spring holidays to everybody. And uh, we'll see you on the Google Plus site. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>